appreciate the presence of each of you with us today. I also want to make mention of the individuals that came yesterday and helped out. I think you can see the difference in the lighting in here with the, the change of the light bulbs. I know that I can read the words on the page in the songbook now, where before it was kind of a, a, a hint and, and a guess type situation. But uh, we are pleased that you were able to be with us here today and the time that we'll spend in talking about the Lord. <clears throat> know your enemy, and you are what is necessary in order to accomplish that. We are, as Christians, we are engaged in a battle. We were in a war, literally. Have been since we became Christians and will be until we take the final breath on this planet. And we are fighting against the, the most formidable army that has ever been assembled. One that has tremendous capabilities and has no limit as to what kind of atrocities it will commit in order to get us to go along with whatever it is that it desires. We are actually faced with three different phases of this enemy. And as we progress, we will, get, we will begin to see that. But in the Ephesian letter from the Apostle Paul in the sixth chapter, verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. As you look at this and think about it, it means exactly what it says. As Christians, our battle is not against the flesh and blood of this world as such. That's the kind of thing that's fought on the battlefield here where you have an obvious foe in front of you and he confronts you with whatever armies or means or whatever uh, circumstances he can raise to come against you. The adversary that we face here is one that has centuries in fact, has had since the very beginning the opportunity to learn mankind, to learn exactly what it is that we are uh, lacking, what our weaknesses are, and he knows you as an individual. He's aware of whatever your, your weaknesses are, and it is at that point that he will attack you. As we look at and consider this, though, as we said, there are three main areas in which this battle takes place. The first one of these is the world itself. The world that's around us, as Ephesians 2 tells us, and we were dead in our trespasses and sin, which we formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This describes you and me. This is how we once were. Before we chose to become Christians, we were in the world. We walked according to our leader, the prince of this world. And he is infinitely capable of, of supplying us with the, the, the things that will help to lead us away. And unfortunately, too much of the time, we go along to get along with him in the world. We have opportunities from time to time in the world as we encounter it day by day to stand up for the Lord, to make a difference in what's presented. And yet we choose to go along with what the world would have us to do. We choose not to say anything. We choose not to, I don't want to upset anyone, so I'm not going to say anything. Even though I know what's going on might be wrong, I'm not going to make the mistake of uh, you know, standing out by going in opposition to it, I'm simply going to go along with the world and the ideas which it presents. And when we think about this, then we go to James 4. And the handout that you have, I apologize for the fact that it's pretty well uh, condensed because uh, when you use the amplified version, it puts a lot more words in it. But I give that to you primarily so you can see some additional thoughts uh, that might be raised as a result of a different uh, translation of the scriptures. But in James 4 and 4, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? 
Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. How often do we make ourselves an enemy of God? How often do you choose to do the way that the world would have you to do as opposed to the way that you know God would have you to do, that you would have you to live your life? You know, the world, it offers us all of these things that we like so well. All of those things, you know, that we just have to have. Just uh, go to Amazon, for instance. That's a good place to start if you want to see what the world has to offer. You can go for forever, I believe, looking at what the world can offer to you today. And as we go through those pages, you just say, oh, I, I, I'd like to have that. Or that would just make all the difference in my life if I had that. And if I just had this, and if I just had the money to get that, then everything would be wonderful. That is precisely what we're talking about here in James 4. Because we are friends with the world. We are friends with the material things that surround us. And how many of those things do you actually have to have? What you find out when you find yourself in a situation where all of this is not available to you, that the reality of what you actually have to have to survive in this life is really pretty limited. You need a place to stay. If you've been in the military, it might be a tent. And it might also be a can of sea rations, which tastes really good, by the way, if you're hungry. <laughs> and so food, shelter, the clothes that you wear, uh, they don't have to be fancy as long as they uh, either keep the rain off of you or, or keep you warm. So what do we really have to have? What do you really actually need in your life today that you don't have? Anything? The car you have out there is a luxury. That you don't have to have that. You could have walked here and say, oh, that's ridiculous. Well, the reality is we could have. And so we are looking at these things and we consider the things of the world as imperatives. I have to have that. I have to have a dishwasher. Or I have to have a washing machine. Or a clothes dryer. Do you? I remember when you washed clothes out with a scrub board and you hung them out on the line and the sun and the wind driving for you. So the reality is, and dishwashing, by the way, that's not a pleasant subject, but, uh, <clears throat> but still, you can do all of these things without all the mechanical things that we think that we have to have. For young couples, when you're starting off in the world today, and I know this from personal experience with my own daughter, <clears throat> when she got married, she thought that it was essential that you have those <clears throat> things I've just been talking about. You know, you don't, you don't wait until you can afford those things. That's just what you're supposed to have. You know, if you live in the United States of America, you are supposed to have these things. I drive past Gainesville High School, which I graduated from a long time ago. Back in the day when I went there, we had, I drove a Model A Ford, and I was in the, in the field. There weren't but about three or four of us that even had a Model A. Now you drive by there and you see more new cars in the parking lot for students than you do for the teachers. That's how things have changed. That's how it's now an imperative that you have a new car if you're a high school student. You know, somehow or other you are less than you could be if you don't have that. So, where are we with the world? We are in love with the world. And that's one of our biggest adversaries. But then that's not all there is to it. And all of these kind of figure into the next one, which is the flesh. First John 2, 15 to 17. We've talked about this before, and you can read over it if you like, but basically they're talking about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We see these things just like what we've talked about. Satan knows how to put these things in our view. We see and we have to have because it looks good. When you look at commercials on television, what do they present to you? When they're showing you an advertisement for beer, who do they show you? 
That's the good time people. Well, that's the good times roll. Boy, we're partying and we're right. You know, if you're anybody, summer's beginning, so if you've got a Corvo in your hands, you're good to go. Everything is wonderful. They don't show this person a few hours later when <coughs> they're hugging a commode or when they're laying passed out. They don't show you that because that wouldn't be good for business. But that's what happens. That's the reality of life. And so Satan doesn't put that picture before you. When you see automobile ads, what do you see? You see people, formal dress, you know, best looking women you ever saw, and most handsome men, uh, finest automobiles. They show you one and they say, why this thing sells for $25,000. And then at the bottom line underneath in the very fine print you can't read it says, as shown, 55,000. So, uh, you know, all of these things are done. This, this is the world and the flesh and the eyes. And we see these things and we want them because we are made that way and our, our prince knows us. And he knows you specifically because the temptations that he will put in your way are the ones that will affect you the most. Whatever the weakness that you had before you became a Christian is the same weakness he will attack. For the individual that was an alcoholic before he became a Christian, alcohol will continue for the rest of your life to be the point on which the, the prince of this world challenges you. He will test you on that continuously. At every opportunity, he will put it before you. Whatever it is, he will use that in order to attack you because he wants to overcome you. But of course, as we look at and think about these things, <clears throat> there's also, we go here to the Roman letter, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So if we don't make provision for these things, if we just recognize that, that these are, this is the, the sales pitch that's being used against us, and that what we need to do is just simply take, stand back and take a look at it and say, is this really and truly me? Is this really and truly what I need and what I want? How much of what I'm doing is back to the world's influence of those that are around me? All of my associates do this, and if I don't do it, then I don't fit in. I'm, I'm not one of the boys. And if I'm not one of the boys, then, you know, uh, I, who am I? And I can remember this very well myself, how important it was to be accepted, to be a part of those that were my peer group. But the reality of it is that it was not really essential that I be part of that peer group. I had the opportunity to be my own person and to do the things that I chose to do and that I knew was right. And I can't begin to tell you how many times I did stuff that I knew was wrong simply because of the ones that I was associated with. And they weren't bad people. Just like every one of us has been associated with people in this world and they're not necessarily what we would call bad people. They're, they're not locked up in prisons today. They're not bank robbers. They haven't murdered anyone or anything like that. But they have been our friends that have lived <coughs> according to the world and what the world wants and what what the world tells us is right and what the world tells us is necessary in order to be successful. And we've talked about in the past about you go to a high school reunion and what does everybody do? Oh boy, you know, you think everybody was somehow or other <clears throat> that would, would put the, the millionaires of this country to shame because, you know, we've been so successful and all that. Uh, even some people even rent them a different car to drive because they don't want to show up in the old wreck they've been driving, but they want to show up in a, in a, a fancy new Lincoln or something like that. You know, you, you've got, you can't show up a failure, but what is that? 
Satan is laughing the whole time at the, the humorous picture that we present because he knows that's not us and we know it's not us. But we're going along with it because as we talked about the self last week, the self is involved in this. But if we put on Christ, we get away from this. But we've been talking an awful lot about it our adversary himself. And this is from the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. And there was war in heaven. Michael and the angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war and they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. This is important because this is the part of know your enemy. Part of knowing our enemy is knowing ourselves. And part of our knowing our enemy is knowing this enemy, the arch enemy of it all. And he uses the world and everything that's in it. But what this tells us is that from very early on, we don't know when this war took place. But angels like us have the opportunity to make our own decisions. God does not put within them or as he has within, within us, cause us to be able, unable to make our own decisions about what we do. And so these angels chose through their leader to rebel against God and they were cast out of heaven. And since they were cast out of heaven and they are been placed on this earth, and of course we have the example that we did when you look at the Garden of Eden. Uh, Satan was there at the very beginning. He didn't show up sometime afterwards as some have argued that Satan really didn't enter the picture until the time of Christ's death on the cross. That was when, when Satan really began to be active. Satan's been active as long as there's been people on the earth. And he's been deceiving people effectively that whole time. And Today we are bearing some of the consequences of those things that have gone before. So as we stop and look at and think about these things, the name that he bears is one of, uh, there's some 27 or so different names, by the way, in the scriptures uh, about who Satan is, the father of lies, the deceiver or murderer. Uh, all of these are terms that are used in regard to him. Now, as we said before, uh, he doesn't have any scruples about what kind of method he uses to try to deceive you. He will use whatever works. And so consequently, uh, we have to be constantly aware and on our guard against these things like this. <clears throat> Going to 2 Corinthians 11. No wonder for even angel uh, Satan describes himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising to us servant, his servants or righteousness whose end will be according to their deeds. Satan describes himself as the good guy. He shows up as the angel of light. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's the good fellow. And his servants describe themselves as servants of righteousness. In other words, there are a lot of people in the world today who are serving their master, Satan. And they appear to be good people. They appear to be people that are doing the right thing, that are standing up for the truth, that are really presenting all the things that should be part of the life of an individual. And many of them are within what is called Christianity today. And so you have to be concerned and you have to be worried about these things. Because as we look at these, the name basically describes it all here. Angels of light and deceivers. And we can be so easily deceived in, in these uh, situations and circumstances. But in the second Corinthian letter, and even in our, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded their mind of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of God, of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the, the image of God. Satan has the ability, if you permit him, to blind you to the truth. He can so present things to you that it seems like it's not what it really is. He is a master of deception. 
And unfortunately, we don't really recognize this or really think about it because he, he used our, our own eyes, our own desires, our own flesh to deceive us, to make us believe that it's all right. How many times have you ever thought, well, I would really like to do that, but you know, it kind of falls in the gray area. I, I don't really know whether as a Christian I ought to do that or not, but I know what I'll do. I'll ask the preacher what he thinks about it. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how many times I get questions or have gotten questions in the past like that. You know what that says? That simply says, I know it's wrong, but I want somebody else to tell me that it's okay. And if the preacher tells me it's okay, then I can let it go. I can do it, and then it'll be all right. We are deceiving ourselves. That is Satan at work. And he is there with you. And he has a lot of helpers. Let me get to that in just a minute, though, as we look at this. Think about this. We have three young men and their father. They're farmers. And the father says, you know, I need you to put me in a well here and put me in a well here and put me in another well over here. So the boys go out and they get busy and they put this well in. And then they put this well in over here. And they say, ah, put that well in here. And then we ask the question. They go back to the father and the father said, did you do what I said? They said, yeah, we did what you said. Did they do what he said? The answer is no. They never did what he said. As long as they agreed with here and here, they did it. But when it was here, they didn't agree with that. So they did it here. The reality is, is this is precisely what we do in our lives. We say, God wants me to do this. God wants me to do this. God wants me to do this. But it would be better if I do this. So that's what I do. And then I say, well, Lord, I did it your way. I did everything you said. I put in the three wells. Right. But you only did what you wanted to do. You never did what, what the Lord wanted. You just did what you wanted to do. Satan at work. Rationalization. We can talk ourselves into doing anything that we choose to do. We can, we can manage it. But we need to take a look at the helpers that Satan has. Because he's not omnip omnipresent like God. He's, he can't be everywhere at once. He, is, he faces essentially the same kind of limitations we do. And that he can only be one place at a time. Now, he's invisible to us if he chooses to be. We can't see him. He is a spiritual being. So we can't put flesh and blood on him and see him. But he can only be one place at a time. So if he is going to carry out what he chooses to do, he has to be able to have helpers. Revelation 12, 4. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Now, essentially, this is a, a passage of scripture, and there's some debate about the fact of whether the stars they are thrown down here were angels. But in most cases, and most commentators, if you look at it, if you study it out, this seems to fit the case that we read about earlier about the war in heaven where the angels were cast out. And then we have this uh, example given where a third. So the general conception is, is that a third of the angels that were in heaven were cast out as a result of this war. Now, I can't prove that, but it fits in with another passage of scripture. In 2 Peter 2, 4, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. So these angels have been thrown out of heaven. Now, whether it was a third of them or not, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference about that, whether there were that many or there were more or less. The reality of it is, is that there were angels that were thrown out of heaven. Now, Obviously, some of them have been reserved in, in, uh, reserved in darkness. Now, you can look at darkness from the standpoint that they are separated from God. That puts them in spiritual darkness. But uh, 
that again is another thing that, for commentators to debate about. But what we do have is this, from the 10th chapter of the book of Daniel, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. And then from the 20th verse, then he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. What is being spoken about here is, these are angels. Daniel had prayed. God sent a man, an angel with a message for him. For three weeks, this angel fought against another angel, the prince of Persia. And it took Michael the archangel to come and get this messenger through to Daniel. Don't make the mistake of believing that there are not, as we initiated at the beginning from the Ephesian letter, that there are principalities and powers that are there that are not of this world. They are there, just as they were in Daniel's time. They are still with us today. These are who work with Satan. These are the ones that are able to work with you on an individual basis and to provide the kind of direction that their leader wants you to have. Satan is, is a party type guy. He wants to have everybody he possibly can to be with him for eternity. And the world is willing to populate hell and is doing a really good job of it. And Satan is enjoying every money of this. He knows what his outcome is going to be. He knows where he's going. And so he's going to take you with him if he possibly can. So if you like the idea of being in hell with, uh, with all of the, the, you might say, the refuse of humanity, then by all means stick with it. But then we go back quickly to Ephesians. <coughs> Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. We are at war with these things, and they are having their effect on us. So we have to do what we can to stand up against these. <clears throat> it applies to every one of us, as this passage of Scripture points out. God looked, overlooked the times of ignorance in the past, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent and to change the course of their life because the day of judgment is coming. And we have a choice to make. We have to cho choose who we're going to serve and who we're going to have spend our life with. And it's up to us. But this, from the Ecclesiastes letter from the 12th chapter, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because his, this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. So whatever you do or have done, all of it will be brought to bear. So the world is around us. It's active and doing everything it can every day. And we have our physical self to deal with, the desires and the lust that we have, and we have Satan in the background striving to lead us in the wrong direction. You're faced with a choice. Today you have to make a choice, and you will make it now. If you need the prayers of the church in your behalf, you have the opportunity to ask for that. If you need to make your confession of your belief in Christ as God's Son, you have that opportunity as well. So you stand at the crossroads. You will make the decision today one way or the other. So if you're subject to the invitation, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.